So welcome everyone. Um, this is the welcome pick please. Um, this is the second of uh, three public meetings for civil society and citizens uh, on Ireland's first action plan for open government. Um, the purpose of these gatherings is, is twofold. Uh, we want to hear the voice of civil society reflected in Ireland's first uh, national action plan on open government. Um, to, make, to, to ensure that that plan itself is, is uh, ambitious and can be built upon in the years ahead. And secondly, the GP offers a brand new space for collaboration between two partners, between civil society and citizens on the one hand and government on the other. And we'd like to get your views on how this new partnership uh, can work. So I'm Mila Hawley, I work for Transparency International Ireland. We're coordinating this consultation, which has been funded by the Department of Public Expenditure Reform, which is leading on the Open Government Partnership uh, on the government side. <coughs> I'm going to take you through the agenda for today, but before I do that, I'd just like to, to recap um, where we're going to, um, particularly for the benefit of those of you who are joining us for the first time today. I see some, some faces in the room of people who were here at the, first, at the first meeting, but I know that some of you are new. So I'm just going to recap a little bit on some of the OGP basics. So what is it? Um, it's an international multi-stakeholder <coughs> initiative. It was founded in 2011 by President uh, Barack Obama on the fringes of a UN General Assembly meeting in New York. It currently has six, about 60 participating countries. So what does it do? Well, countries develop uh, action plans in consultation with uh, civil society and citizens. Uh, the hope is that these will be ambitious action plans with stretch commitments in, in around the areas of transparency, participation, accountability, and technology. Using technology to improve governance, specifically. But as you'll hear again and again today, OGP is not about a moment in time, it is a process. It's a continued, continuous process of implementation and review and renewal of action plans, action plan commitments. So I think it's worth pausing to consider what OGP is about because very quickly it can sound um, quite high level and almost abstract. But fundamentally it is actually about people despite the language. Um, it's about public services that are better because users have had an input into their design. It's about wiser public spending because um, data is readily available. It's about less corruption because decisions aren't made behind closed doors. So as I mentioned, this is the second of three public meetings. This is our first meeting on um, the 10th of July. We got off to a really strong start, thanks to really high caliber of, of speakers and participants and facilitators. Now at that session, we broke up into four working groups, and these are based on the four core principles of the Open Government Partnership, accountability, citizen participation, technology, innovation, and transparency. Participants set about that day identifying barriers and solutions in, the, in these areas, um, really robust discussions in the workshops and in, in the plenary uh, session afterwards. And then since then, there's been some really get great contributions online because we, we summarise the outputs of the of the working group discussions and they, they've been online on the website for people to add to and thankfully many people did. So what's the end point? So here we are in, in, the, in the second of three meetings. At the last meeting on the 5th of September we finalise our deliberations and uh, they will be presented to the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in a report and the, part, the department has asked us to report back to them on civil society and citizens' proposals for concrete commitments for an action plan, our rationale for these, and our proposed prioritisation, and also our, our views on how stakeholder participation in the OGP in the future can be uh, deepened and widened. So, what happens after that? Well, this is this is a really crucial uh, question, and this is this is the, the formula in theory. Um, civil society's proposals will go together with the government's uh, department's own proposals to form a draft action plan. And um, in practice, that bit of the question is still to be determined, and that's, that's something that we need to be thinking about today and um, 
and, and, and lead to long term damage because since study has peculiar to be exercised, or sorry, uh, organized, and uh, actually, but um, to engage with government in in, uh, in in what actually after we deliver our, our wishes, if you like, that's when kind of talking has to, has to take part at at a, at a more detailed granular level, and uh, and that's what we need to be thinking about. Here at that stage, feedback is crucial, and this is something that comes up time and time again in um, OGP experiences in other countries, that, that feedback is sometimes lacking, so we'd like to get that to over right. And, um, and then there's an ongoing role, of course, of a society, because as I mentioned, OGP is not about just one action plan, it's about, it's about building a new partnership and about creating rolling action plans that, and new commitments, as some commitments are delivered. So we need to be thinking about how we organise ourselves engage with that. So, turning to today, we've got some work to do. We have great speakers, um, great facilitators and moderators, and a very dedicated bunch of volunteers, note-takers, and general organizers who are going to help us get through it and keep us on course. Should our minds wander, I'm sure that won't happen. So, so what we want to achieve today we're going to, um, we're really fortunate to have two excellent speakers with us, experienced civil society experts and also um, veterans, fresh-faced veterans of the OGP process, um, Paul Masson and Simon Burrell, and I'll introduce them later. And then our working group uh, facilitators are going to bring us up to date on, on the discussions that we had at the last meeting since online. And then after lunch, after short lunch, we're going we're to break up into working groups again and and sort of filter and focus. As I said at the last session, we, we identified barriers and solutions, and in this working group session, we hope to progress that into to what actual action plan commitments might look like um, under, the, under the solutions that we identified. And we're, we, 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 we're, we're going to use a sort of smart technology, smart methodology to, to, to try and do that, to try and come up with action plan commitments that are, that are realistic and measurable, action-oriented and time-bound. We're very pleased that civil servants from a range of government departments have joined us um, today so they too can learn more about OGP um, and see how they can play a part. And um, they're invited to join working group discussions as resources for the groups and um, giving information on what's current policy and what's not. So after the working groups finish, you'll have a chance to stretch your legs and, um, and prepare for the plenary session. Now, some of you may have noticed that there's a, a quite a random-looking ballot paper in your uh, in your briefing packs there. So all will be revealed later. But this is this is part of a, a, a voting exercise that we're going to ask you to do just before lunch. And it's, it's said so that we can illustrate to you a very interesting um, methodology of uh, consensual decision making. We invited uh, Peter Emerson to, to do a big presentation on that, just at the final plenary. It's a, it's a methodology that's been used by the National Women's Council and uh, the Our Future Movement. And uh, it's regularly used by the Green Party, to, for the party to set its own um, priorities for policy decisions. Um, uh, so we do that exercise just before lunch, and ask you to fill in the ballots and, and leave them on the shares before you go for, for the break. Um, we're presenting it today because it's a tried and tested uh, process that we could use at our last meeting to prioritise our action plan proposals. So then the facilitators are going to give their, their feedback at the, at the final plenary, and again we'll have a chance to open up the conversation at that stage to uh, cross fertilise um, ideas once again and to get you thinking about what future stakeholder engagement. So um, finally, I'd just like to, to point out to you that in your registration, in your materials as well, you also have a postcard from the future, which uh, is asking you to, to think big, to close your eyes and tap your red sparkly shoes, and um, describe a, a single change that has made government um, different by, by 2018. We have a panel at the back of some of the postcards that people filled in, filled in the last time, so please feel free to post it. Post it just paid, so. Any word of that. Now, I'd like to remind you this event is live streamed 
And we will take photos for our website, so if any, any of you wouldn't care to photograph, that, please let us know. Um, the Wi-Fi details are on the pillars around you, and um, you can tweet them on hashtag OGPRL, or sorry, hashtag OGPRL. Now to get on the way, we're joined by two very able and interest, uh, interested uh, OGP experts, and they're going to spend the day with us um, joining the working group sessions. Paul Masson is the Independent Civil Society Coordinator for the Open Government Partnership, so it's his, his role to support in-depth civil society engagement with OGP. So he has a very broad knowledge of um, civil society engagement in OGP in many countries around the world. And he's also got a lot of uh, other relevant experience uh, in the World Wildlife Fund and also the Dutch Development Organization, HIVOS. And Simon Burrell is the director of uh, INVOLVE, and that's a, a London-based NGO which is which specialises in public participation. So it's great that we have him here today, both again as a speaker and a resource. And he, um, he his organisation coordinates the UK's Open Government Partnership Civil Society Network, a loose coalition of NGOs who've been feeding into the OGP action plan over there. So Simon Paul, you're very welcome to join us. <coughs> Pro-government, 
very difficult country as a result. That it wasn't the right starting point. So you have to see you know, what works. So having the right, I think focusing on laying the foundation in this first period is really important. Um, which partly is structure and partly is culture. And there's a lot of experience throughout the country, and I hope we get there um, uh, with the conversation on how countries have gone about it. But it's what's interesting to see is that the stuff that works is um, where government gives space to civil society to self-organize and self-select. Um, and where, where there's space also to, to manage, government is perhaps the bigger word, but at least to manage the OCD process in a, in a relatively balanced and equal way. Um, in Peru, government and, and civil society, they uh, alternate who is the secretariat of, of sort of the, uh, the secretariat going forward. So there's a lot of experience if you look around the countries, which we can, which I can share later on. Also, where if you think about setting up the platform moving you forward when the first action plan is there, and hopefully you start implementing, as far as I can say, you start implementing in January. Um, that how can you drive this process forward? How can you create a platform that that slowly builds this partnership, this relationship of trust that will get the change that, you, that this is actually about. So it's about this change. You should facilitate the change. I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nilo. Um, so um, in five minutes, I'm really going to give you some headlines rather than sort of prompt discussion rather than trying to kind of go into detail because there's a lot of detail and, and um, and there's a danger of descending into that. So I'll briefly tell you about the UK process to give you a little bit of context, a couple of sentences, and then give you four or five lessons. So um, the UK is now on its second national action plan. We were one of the founding um, eight countries of the uh, of OGP. Uh, and the first action plan was formed on the back of a very standard government consultation about open data that they then just basically swung into and said, oh, and by the way, this is now going to form the basis of the, the, our national action plan. So the first national action plan was done on a very standard consultation. You told us we've gone and done something different anyway. Um, and very, very focused on open data. Um, and neither the government or bits of the government and certainly civil society were very happy with that. So the second process um, was brought together by uh, cabinet office officials and civil society actors coming together and saying, how do we do this differently? And we wanted to move away from this government listening and going away and doing to something different. So we sat down and agreed we were going to try and co-produce the National Action Plan. And we got agreement from the Minister that um, senior civil servants with civil society could sit down and draft the National Action Plan together as a, a submission to him. A very, very different way of doing government. It hasn't quite worked like that. But as an ambition, it was, it was quite a different way of, of doing things and very different for Whiteboard. And I guess in the end, that's picking up on Paul's point, doing this open government thing properly means doing government differently. And it means civil society moving out of its comfort zone, and it means government moving out of its comfort zone. And finding ways to set up a process that allows you to do it is in the end be, going to be the ultimate goal, I think. As long as you also get some, some useful commitments and something that holds government to account in the end. So, um, much of what I'm going to say in terms of lessons from that process are going to be negative, and I don't want to be overly negative, because I think we set out with quite a lot of ambition, and there's a lot positive, but lessons are quite often negative, aren't they? First of all, we sat down on a weekly basis with senior civil servants, and we, we talked about the National Action Plan, we talked about the content of the plan, we talked about the, the structure of the plan, and we got a significant move away from Open Data to Open Data Plus, and that was a long way from where the Minister wanted to be, and a fairly significant change. What we didn't get were a series of, of solid commitments underneath. The draft action plan is now published for consultation. Um, and in discussion, you might want to get into why that is. That ongoing process was really important. It was really important for building trust between individuals in civil society and individuals in government. And it meant that when the process began to go pear-shaped, there was enough understanding that the goodwill was there and the reasons it was going pear-shaped, we would need to work together to solve them. There were different people's responsibility shared across civil society and government, and we would have to work together um, to do it, to, to sort them out. I think that trust is really quite important. Um, there, is, there are a number of buts to that, though. Um, one, it was a very small group of civil society organisations that were engaging with a small group of civil, of civil servants. 
Um, and I think our communications within the wider network could have been better. A number of organisations who've been sitting at the end of an email list came in at the end and said, what's this process? We don't recognise it. What's this talk of co-production? You can't do that with government. So very different views of doing that. In the network we have people like me, we're really space creators. And then we have some fairly hardened campaigners who've been working on freedom of information for, for 20, 25 years. We don't talk the same language. And so finding ways to communicate and build trust within the network across some very different domains is as important as that communication with government. Um, and then I think where we have, I think, done quite well is being very clear about who we are. OGP is a, is a, is a geek fest. It's about democracy, accountability, transparency, open data. There's a whole bunch of governance geeks and so on. We don't talk the language of normal citizens. We don't talk the language even of those civil society organisations working on health or schools. We talk a very different language and we've been very clear from the start, we do not represent civil society as a whole. We are a small group of experts who have something to say in this agenda and one of the things we have to do collectively and with government is reach out beyond that. So we've not made any big claims which I think has helped protect the process and, and stop government saying they've consulted with civil society generally. We will see when the plan is published whether that is still the case. Um, so, and one of the big questions, and one of the, one of the things we really have to do as this goes on is talk a different language, move this out to the language of ordinary citizens to my mother, basically. Um, and number four, a lesson is we are the co-chair of the OGP at the moment. The Minister, Francis Maud, wants, this is his big moment on the international stage. Um, I hope he's not watching this live stream. Um, and, uh, and he wants to make this work, he really wants to, so there's a political moment for us. I think if it hadn't been flat a political moment, it would be much harder for us to move it from open data to open data plus. So identifying or creating the political moment that puts some heat on both sides is quite important. Having the senior political buy-in, the civil servants knew that in the end the minister supported this and it meant they could go further than perhaps they could have done or they, um, if they hadn't, and their bosses were supportive too. But, so having that support higher up is important. However, the team changed a lot. And having real depth in government and making sure that your network across government is really quite important, both within the team that's, that's responsible for OGP. But the, the, my final point would be, the reason we haven't yet got the commitments right within um, the action plan is because the conversation with all with the cabinet office, with the bit of government that was doing OGP, and yet the commitments had to come from Ministry of Justice, local government, <coughs> development, and they weren't involved at all. And so when the draft action plan went for the right around and sign off across government, all the ministers said, what's this? I'm not signing up to this. And it was a, a really challenging moment. If we hadn't had that trust from the ongoing conversation, I think the whole thing would have fallen apart. So, the communication both with civil society but also ensuring that you've got all the relevant partners across government brought into that conversation from the start is really quite important. And the sort of density of links within civil society and across government is really important. Uh, before I throw it it's hard to resist. You said it went pear shaped and um, maybe give us a bit more detail on that. Was that, was that when your aspirations? So, so it was really when we were having this, these conversations around both the narrative, which was basically fine and not that challenging for government, but the specific commitments around each of the dimensions of our action plan, which look very similar to your working groups, by the way. And there are a series of, of commitments that civil society was trying to get from government, that some of which we knew government wasn't going to buy, others of which were pushing government further, and some of which government hadn't really even thought about. Um, and so when the Ministry of Justice was confronted with, um, with a specific commitment that they had been involved on, they were unwilling to sign it off. And so in the end, what we have is a series of civil society demands that have gone into an annex of the, um, of the National Action Plan. But it was looking difficult to even get that. So because the government departments didn't understand the process and didn't understand that this was a different way of doing things, they struggled to see how can we publish things that we're never going to do in a government document, even in an annex. So, and if they come out of the annex, I think civil society would have walked away. And it was challenging enough to keep people on board um, with them in the annex. So it, it went pear-shaped in the sense of how other bits of government understood how government works from how the cabinet office team was seeing government working very, very differently. 
So how do you get that culture of government and the content understood widely, both by civil society and by government? Yeah. No, very good. Um, can I, can I ask, do we have microphones for people to, um, can I ask to, to maybe take, we have, we have um, 20 minutes and uh, a little bit more for, for conversation, Paul, Simon here, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. So can I take maybe a couple of questions and um, we'll ask Paul and Simon as well. Anybody want to go on, is it? If you could edit by yourself, it would be great. Although well, 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 I'm, I'm just a citizen, I'm not a member of the group. Um, I just want to ask Simon, the process in the UK was clearly top down. People got to the cabinet office and got to some people in the cabinet office. And um, obviously a lot of innovation starts like that. But surely you're not surprised that it went pear-shaped because you didn't go out to the people who had to implement it. I mean, you, you guys were talking to the generals, but the people who make things happen on the ground are the majors and the sergeants and the corporals, and they're going to resist. I mean, we've seen that here with freedom of information, and it's going to continue. It's, it's all very well at, at that senior political level and at senior civil society level, but way down the ranks where somebody has to produce uh, memos that they, uh, they, they, they made up three years ago, and they, you know, uh, they filed away. I mean, that's, you know, so it's, that's not, it's not enough, it's a, you need a much deeper culture of change. So, I mean, can you give us any pointers of how to avoid that, or do we just have to go slower? And start to restore freedom of information, accountability. It's so basic, everyone is accountable. So why not focus on that, which obviously brings in transparency and some of the other points. All right, great. Um, can I start with you, Simon? Speaking to, speaking to top brass and uh, deliberations, so why were you surprised when you were disappointed? Although we were, well, we were, well, we were only speaking to top brass and not the others, I think, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think that I think the problem is always worse than you were saying, in the sense that um, we were talking to some of the top brass, but the other top brass in the other departments or regiments didn't necessarily uh, didn't necessarily buy into or agree with um, agree with it. Why weren't we surprised? Of course, we should have been surprised. I think one of the problems is that the agenda is huge. The marshalling of civil society in itself is a really big job. And Lula, I don't uh, relish your job just as much as I don't really relish mine. So it's, it's a difficult thing in and of itself. Um, we trusted that, that we were we were set up processes that we thought the cabinet office was beginning to do that conversations across um, uh, across government that turned out not to be happening the way that we thought they were. Um, so you know there were things happening. Yes, we, we should have anticipated it. Um, uh, um, but we thought it was happening. I guess, the, more importantly, lessons. Uh, you highlighted one for me, I think. Go slower. Go, be, don't be too ambitious. Really highlight some of the, a couple of the really key commitments and really work on them. 
having a narrative about all the other things. The reason I'm excited about OGP is because I've been working in this area for 15 years or so, and what OGP does for me is it brings together a number of things that people have tried to bring together before with a changing context that means that it really feels like you can move forward. So you need to have the narrative across the whole thing, but really focus on either those that you think where you can make get movement or those that are absolutely fundamental, but don't try and do too much. And really think about the links in civil society and government and making those connections stronger. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. And that kind of leads me on to the third question, um, in a way, is I, I was kind of um, uh, thinking, thinking a little bit about about this as you were talking, I've now totally forgotten what I was going to say. I'm going to come back to that, if you lost the thought. How to deal with the larger issues. You talked about this being a research issue, actually those larger issues are live in the UK as well. You know, we, our second chamber is not elected, um, we've got first past the post, a whole series of kind of big, big issues that aren't just research issues actually, they're really political issues. Um, so how do you deal with them within the National Action Plan? I think in part it is about just having a narrative about having a story about where you're going um, and accepting that part of this, and I guess this does lead into where I wanted to go for my answer to the third question, which is accepting you can't get there in one go, but thinking what are the places where you can begin to make a difference um, that will open up culture in some way. So you were asking at the back, Paddy, about um, accountability and freedom of information. Those are two things that a uh, government really doesn't want at all. Where those turkeys are not going to vote, vote for that. So the question is, where can you make inroads that make it easier to get to them further down the line? It doesn't mean you shouldn't stop doing those things. And indeed, some within the network will say, we don't get those things, it's not worth doing at all, talking about different perspectives of how you do these things. My perspective is, we have to keep banging on about those things. But at the same time, we can be making progress, making sure that when government opens up data, it's opened up in a way that actually makes it very difficult for it to be closed down again makes it very difficult for government not to have meaningful conversations about it, and makes it very difficult for government not to say, oh, there's more data we've got to give out now. So you can actually do some things that government thinks it wants to do, but then mean it has to do more and gets you closer to freedom of information and accountability in a different way. Yeah, building, building on, on what Simon was saying, I mean, there is a tension there, right? Because on the one hand, we say the problems are used, we want to include them, and on the other hand, go smaller and, and slower. Um, how, how other countries deal with it is a couple of points. One is, is thinking of what do you want to achieve in five years or ten years and working backwards and then saying, okay, if we want to get to a, uh, to a stage where government proactively releases information, where you're far from it, um, what is realistic to have in one or two years? If you look, for example, at the action plan of, of Ghana, that's where they have their, their commitments are framed in something bigger they want to achieve, but then with milestones of what they want to achieve in two years and one year, and that even broken down into, okay, we want to finally pass freedom of information law. They don't have it. They've been discussing it for 10 years. What are the steps to get there? How can we involve the wisdom of civil society in, in passing a law that meets their expectations to some extent? Never fully properly, but to some extent. Um, and if we have done that conversation, then what? And then what? And then what? And that's a way of, of getting to the bigger, to the bigger things. Going to, to other countries, what I really liked about Costa Rica and Mexico, they, they really had a good dialogue between government and civil society. Mexico done initially, but it was so bad that there was a fight and then something good came out of it. But they, they, they had these conversations, mostly a civil society, but from the start with civil servants and broadly, not just the cabinet office or sort of the leading entity, but throughout, of what the priority are. And very open. So, very, very open from the government side and saying, well, sorry, this is really not on the political agenda for the coming year, so you can ask, we can even put it in the plan, but it's not going to make you happy because it's not, you know, it's, it's not there. Uh, but also on civil society side, realizing that we as civil society always ask for the, uh, the moral best in a way. Um, and that real life is, you know, different than that. So also thinking of, okay, what out of our ten big asks, which, is, which are the three that we really, really want to have the next three years? 
And what I liked about it, they did it in both countries, is so they had this initial set of priorities, then the government went back into their systems and bureaucracies to figure out where the political will and the political resistance is. Um, they came back, they had an open dialogue about saying, well, you know, Costa Rica, for example, civil society really wanted the freedom of information law, and it's not going to happen. Not because the government doesn't want it, they don't have a majority in parliament. Their, their take on assessing parliament is not going to happen. So we can put it in, we can work on it, we can massage it, but we're not promising it because it's not going to happen. And that openness, again, going back to what I was saying before, it's long term change, it's building a partnership. And if you have this open conversation, trying to understand from both sides what you want, why you want it, why it is an issue or not. Around the freedom of information, one thing they promised in Ghana was to um, to go on a two-day retreat. It sounds very um, luxurious and nice safari thing, but to go away for two days and to really, really in-depth discuss the asks of civil society. What, why are they not happy with the draft law? What is the reasoning behind it? Uh, what is the international evidence behind it, etc.? And in a way, really having the conversation and trying to convince each other of what's possible, what's realistic, where we should go. And even if you don't agree in the end, you make big progress on probably an understanding of each other. Um, so that's, I think that's all sort of part of it. And that, yeah, that, that is the basis you get for, for slowly getting there. On the point of starting from the top, that also is really a context specific thing because in some countries that works brilliantly, right? Um, in, in the US where, where the president when he moves in, he appoints six layers or seven layers deep in the bureaucracy. If he wants something, it's probably going to happen. In European yeah, countries, at the federal level, at the federal level that's mm -hmm. right. European levels are usually different. Well, that's true, and that's uh, and that comes to your point of innovation. And I'll get there. Um, in European countries, the bureaucracy has more a, a will of its own, in a way. I mean, I'm from the Netherlands. Politicians can say what they want, but the bureaucracy does what they want. So, you know, some changes can come, but the bureaucracy they have to stay, they have to move the whole thing forward. On the innovation, I think that's one of the debates that's going on in within OGP is. How can we how can we involve the other levels of government where actually a lot of the innovation is happening? At the city level, an enormous amount of innovation is happening. Um, in, in Mexico and the US, at, at state level, a lot of stuff is happening. But the EU is also doing a lot uh, around open data, for example. So how to involve them in this debate and get them to deliver commitments and, and fit it into the, the picture as well, which is which is difficult because we're still trying to get the federal level right. But I think if you talk about, like some of you were saying about getting close to the citizen, the city level is where you get close to the citizen. I mean, getting at the federal level with commitments around freedom of information law, close to the citizen, that's really challenging. You can do it, of course you can do it. Um, but it's much easier if you have concrete stuff at the city level around health and education, etc. Um, now we're running a bit over time. Does anybody else uh, like to ask anything? Um, uh, I, I, I personally have. Oh, sorry, do you have, do you have a question? No, it's, it's more like a comment and a question, but in some ways it's an opportunity. I'm not on because we have some discussion there. On, uh, we have some discussion there on, uh, about the, the um, removing the, our second chamber, the, the, the Senate, yes. And, uh, it seems an opportune time, really, in terms of OGP civil society to, to promote this kind of agenda and say, OK, we're well, not saying this is an alternative, but it's another way of looking at what second change is well intended to do. So I'm just saying it's an opportune time to be promoting OGP in Ireland, and uh, it might find favour in government in the sense that they also have to make convincing case as to why the second chamber is not that becomes necessary. And, uh, the OGP civil society agenda might be, might be one of the avenues that we're prepared to push. Thank you, Paul. Um, oh, so I'd like to ask you quickly to um, talk to us a little bit about what's happened after the first action plan has been um, delivered and how the civil society you maintain that engagement. You've given some examples and you've been experiencing that. Many countries, especially civil society, are struggling with okay, what is our role in, in the implementation.
relation to this, right? I mean, is it, um, is it the Kenyan minister saying, well, you know, we're a great government, just help us deliver, and that's your role as civil society? Well, I'm, I'm sure civil society across the globe doesn't agree with that. Um, so balancing this, you know, being a trusted partner and at the same time still being a watchdog, which is also the role of civil society, I think is the most tricky one. And in a way, if you have a broad civil society, you can do both because you can sort of have different tasks and you know, I, like you mentioned I worked for WWF and there you know the thing was always okay Greenpeace gets on the boat and, and sort of is the activist and then when the door is open WWF walks in and starts negotiating and both of them knew that and that, that worked fine um, so you can have different roles to give a few examples I think basically most countries where the OGP process works they have a formalized platform or forum for an ongoing dialogue but that's, that's a key one. There's, a, there's something, and it's usually between 8 and 20 uh, people large, uh, either just government and civil society, or government, civil society, academics, and the business sector, but something like that, with a clear mandate. And then it works stronger if there's a dedicated secretariat, usually at the government side, someone really driving the process forward. Um, the structure can be very formal, like Ghana has a steering committee, Peru has something with an incredibly long name in Spanish, um, which is a presidential decree to create a new legal entity to drive OGP forward. Um, but it's, it's formalized. And that, so that's important. And then to get that going, um, to get the roles and responsibility right. So what do you expect of that group or not? Is it just sharing information? Is it co-managing the process? Or is it even <coughs> governing? Process. In some countries it's impossible, but you know, a lot of countries actually do it. They co govern the OGP process at national level. A really important one here is um, for the civil society at least self selection for civil society. Don't try as a government to control the civil society. That doesn't work. It goes down completely the wrong way. Um, the countries where it's strongest, it's civil society selecting, it's very difficult to do. Um, because, it, like you said, the different opinions of the activists and the diplomats and all in one room. But usually what ends up is, it, is an interesting mix of having one sort of lead contact person on civil society side, mm -hmm. David Simon, for example, having four to eight people in sort of a core group or a core team or a steering committee. But then also having, having a mechanism for regularly informing and reaching out to broader civil society. Not just in the consultation, when you need them in a way to get opinions, um, but throughout. And that's not just, that's the responsibility both of the civil society people and of the uh, government as well. So that's on the civil society. And I think something similar of involving broader groups of, like you were saying a couple of times, broadening the group of reformers in the space within government is as important. Very quickly, but, um, one of the reasons I think the Open Government Partnership is so such an interesting mechanism is it's got the joint governance of government and civil society at the international level. But there are very few international initiatives like that. But it also has an independent reporting mechanism. And unlike any other that I know about, this isn't peer review. This isn't government scratching each other's backs. This is genuinely independent, separate from the governments. The governments can't sign off the reports as I understand it. So these will come out. That is really important. So there is an international um, uh, set of experts and, and, uh, and senior people, national researchers coming down and looking at the National Action Plan, looking at the process, questioning government and civil society. Um, and civil society's engagement with that process seems to me to be really quite important because that is one way of creating more political momentum. Talking to government, if you don't get this right, you're actually going to be independently assessed and this is going to look bad within the context of open government. So that's quite important. And the final thing I would say is, I think one of the big commitments, given where we are with the National Action Plan in the UK at the moment, one of the most important commitments that we can get into the National Action Plan, the second one, is a commitment to review on a regular basis government and civil society sitting down together as equals commitments over the course of the next two year National Action Plan. Not waiting until the end, but actually looking at the commitments as they are on a regular, maybe every six months basis, and actually really seriously doing it in the open and keeping some pressure on. It provides a moment for keeping the network together 
provides a moment for bringing, maintaining those relationships with government, and it keeps the heat on government for actually doing something about the commitments. So I think there's something about the international review and really engaging with that process, and then about creating spaces where government commits to doing it within the action plan, so then you've actually got a space to keep going um, with government and making things. <coughs>